We're with constitutional attorney Jonathan E. Moore. Jonathan, what else are you looking at these days? Well, I'm deeply concerned, uh, as I explained in my book, The Rise of Tyranny. I'm deeply concerned with the growth of the administrative state. You know, George, nine-tenths of all federal law are now no longer the product of the people we elect to office, but rather they're the product of over 250 independent regulatory agencies that truly run this country. We're ruled by a bureaucratic oligarchy. We no longer have a republic in this country. And it's a horror because it's really the, a manifest example of tyranny. Uh, in a nation that's constitution is a constitution of liberty, where governments are instituted among men to protect the rights of the governed, we now have that turned on its head, and we live very much like we did under the reign of George III. We are deprived of liberty by bureaucratic agencies that exercise legislative, executive, and judicial power combined, which James Madison said was the very definition of tyranny. So apparently we have Madison's definition of tyranny and indeed Montesquieu's definition of tyranny working in this country. And it's one of the, fr- the reasons why we're so frustrated by government, why it seems nothing ever changes and everything seems to get worse. And presently I'm fighting the Federal Trade Commission in a number of cases, and I'm really appalled by the fact that Honest people who work hard for a living, who come up with inventions that transform uh, society, can be brought down financially and their business is ruined and their employees rendered unemployed by a bureaucratic agency that goes wild over the meaning of a sentence. And not only that, over implied meanings that don't even exist in any advertising or promotion that they do. It's, it's government-run riot. It's bureaucracy without uh, accountability. It's uh, the rule of law being transgressed by agencies that can rewrite every sentence that is adopted in a statute by the people's elected representatives. It is often the case, not seldom, but often the case, that laws intended to mean one thing when passed by Congress are reinterpreted to mean the opposite by the regulatory agencies. And they're the ones that implement the laws. So we are in trouble, George, in this country. We sure are. And we really need to restore the republic before we lose it. You know, the famous line is from uh, Benjamin Franklin when he left, left the Constitutional Convention. He was asked by a, a passerby, uh, what have we got, uh, um, Dr. Franklin? And he said, a republic, if you can keep it. Well, we've, we've lost it, George. We have elements of it, but principally, it's no longer here. The republic given to us, which was the, the greatest thing in the history of the world, the first instance of a written constitution that was for liberty, for individual liberty, a government instituted among men to protect their rights, unique and extraordinary event, has been sapped away, principally from the 1930s to the present, until now we have the rule of law dictated by people we don't elect, who impose upon us restrictions on our liberty, on our businesses, without ever having to account for what they do. everyone, this is Sophia Smallstorm doing another podcast. It's the month of July in America, and I have with me today Al Whitney, also known sometimes as Anita Whitney, and you may hear me call her both things in this interview. Um, Al is a friend of a friend of mine, but I'm just getting to know her, and she is a very um, committed person in many different fields. Uh, she's a, an anti-vaccine activist. She has some uh, websites pertaining to that. But she is also someone who has started plumbing this idea of what is our government? What is this corporate state that um, dictates to us? Because it appears that that is the case. Now, I had heard about this some years ago, and periodically you run into people who 
you know, put it right in front of you and go, can't you see this is what it's about? You need to immerse yourself. You need to take this co- online course and that. And it always seemed like a massive amount of work. And I never really did that work. I didn't undertake those studies, although my awareness about this has increased, especially lately. But I'm very happy to know Anita, Al, I guess we'll just trade off. And um, she can explain it to to me and to us in this podcast. So welcome, Anita. How are you? I'm great. And thank you so much, Sophia, for for having me on and giving me this opportunity to, to kind of help people understand what is government and what is our legal system? Um, because without that understanding, there are a lot of traps people inadvertently, unwittingly, unknowingly fall into. Well, sure. Now, tell us, like, how did you be- become absolutely convinced of this? Well, I, as you mentioned, I have a vaccine site, and that was my first website um, in 2009, when we had this false pandemic, I heard Dr. Sherry Tenpenny, who's been giving lectures on the, the problems with vaccines for many years, and I heard her on Alex Jones talk about the fact that they had passed emergency legislation since 2001. And I was concerned in my state, I live in Ohio, whether or not the legislators had passed any laws or rules forcing the people to accept vaccines during a pandemic. Um, Since I had been a court-appointed special advocate for uh, children in Franklin County as a volunteer for several years, I was familiar with the um, Ohio Revised Code because it was through the Ohio Revised Code they told us we had the authority to do what we were doing. So I knew enough about it to go to the Ohio Revised Code and look at public health statutes and try to figure out what kind of rules or regulations the uh, state legislature had passed. That started my investigation, Sophia. It started out with just one little question that I wanted answered. And, whoa, I got a whole lot more than the answer to one little question. Because when I started reviewing it, I, the language that they were using in the Ohio Revised Code, which is a representation of the rules and regulations that the Ohio legislature passes, I started reading the words, and the words um, caught my attention. Uh, let me. Can I give you an example? I looked at the, the, the definition that they have in the Ohio Revised Code, for the school board. And again, if people recall, during that pandemic, they were trying to set up clinics in the different schools to give vaccinations, which had me greatly concerned. So I, I thought, well, well, what gives the school board the authority to put up these clinics? I even contacted them and tried to caution them. This isn't a good idea. This is a, a dangerous vaccine. It hasn't been tested, blah, blah, blah. And I got a response back from them where they said they'd already signed the contract with public health. And I have that in my file here. And I'm thinking, okay, well, this is kind of strange. So I looked up the school board in the Ohio Revised Code, Sophia, and I'm going to read it to you because this is what piqued my interest. It is. Anybody can go online and look this up. You know, it's. I even took a picture of it. Um, this is code 3313.17. The corporate powers of the board, the board of education of each school district shall be a body politic and corporate and as such capable of suing and being sued, contracting and being contracted with, acquiring, holding, possessing and disposing of real and personal property and taking and holding in trust for the use and benefit of of such district, any grant or device of land, and any donation or bequest of money or other personal property. And that just piqued my interest because that body politic and corporate, uh, I'm thinking, what what is this? I mean, this is not what I thought the government was all about. Well, wait, let me interrupt you, please. First of all, what vaccine were 
was this all about? H1N1, were- remember, in two, no, 2009? Yeah. H1N1? Yeah. Um, and so a body politic that's able to sue and what did it say? Possess property and right. all of that? Right. And so that struck you as odd. Why? Because what did you think the school boards were? Um, well, for several reasons, this struck me as odd. Okay. One is we're always told that the government is sovereign and you can't really sue them. And here it says it's a corporate body capable of suing and being sued. I found that strange. Okay. Contracting and being contracted with. I found that strange. Um, possessing and, and disposing of personal prop, personal property. I found that strange. And then the fact that they could accept any donation or bequest of money. I found that strange as well. So I looked into the rules and the statutes regarding public health and how it could be that the school board would be contracting with the Department of Public Health without any input from the people, none at all, none whatsoever. In fact, when I wrote them a letter saying I was very concerned about these clinics, I got this letter back. It pretty much blew me off like, we don't care what you think, we signed a contract with public health. So I started to realize that this is all about business. And I even questioned one of the public health employees. And I said, you know, you're listed on Dun and Bradstreet as a corporation. You're just a corporation. And they said, well, we know, but we're we're that way just so we can do business. And that's their attitude. They know they're, they all know they're corporate bodies. They all know it. And they are told by their superiors that the only reason they're corporations is so they can do business. Now, most of us who go to the polls and elect government um, don't do so so that they can do business. We do so because it is our perception that they are representing our interests. Okay, so that's a very important distinction. So you had this revelation right. that these organizations that we believe are subparts of the government right. are actually corporate entities conducting business with one another contractually. Right. And so we have to define what this stuff is called business, right? Right. What is it? Well, that's that's where the crux of the matter comes in. That is so important that you ask that. Because what they're doing is they're conducting business via contracts. And what we need to understand, the thing about a corporation, and this is hard for so many people to get, that a corporation isn't real, it's a fiction. All it is is a bunch of words on a piece of paper filed in a safe somewhere. It isn't real. If all the people went home from the public health department and stopped going to work, the public health department would stop existing because it is just a structure. It's a people call it a legal construct. Now, because that's what it is, they are bound by the laws of contracts. A corporation, the people, a corporation, be it public health corporation or Monsanto, cannot shake your hand and say, good, let's make this agreement. They cannot uh, openly discuss anything because it's just a fiction. The corporation can't nod its head. The corporation cannot even unincorporate itself. Okay? It cannot control itself because it's a fiction. And I've tried so many ways to get people to understand that, that, um, For instance, people will say the state of Ohio decided this. Well, I challenge people to get the state of Ohio on the phone. They can't get the state of Ohio on the phone because it's a fiction. And therefore, it is bound by the contracts that people engage in on its behalf. Now, I'm not not a uh, shareholder of the state of Ohio, Sophia. I'm not getting a check from this corporation are you (laughs) so there are profits going into these institutions 
And um, they are not non-profit corporations. They are for-profit corporations. Right. So when you say you can't get the state of Ohio on the phone, right? fine, I get it. But you can call up somebody in a department in the state of Ohio and talk to them, right? I can talk to an employee. Right, of the state. Of this fictional corporation. Right. And so the doing business really amounts to exchanging sums of money with the goal of making profits. Right. And and contract law. It's all about contract law. Because corporations can't do anything but enter into contracts, um, everything they do is about contract law. And that's so important everybody to understand. It's all about contracts. So, Anita, um, when did it get to be this? What, at what point in the evolution of America did this all start? Well, in 1871, when they founded the Washington District of Columbia, it was founded as a corporation. They altered the Constitution for the United States with a small U uh, at that time, and they incorporated it into, and just to fool everybody, the Constitution of the United States, and the federal government became a corporation. Now, many people say that's because they were in financial straits, and the bankers wouldn't loan them any money or do anything with them unless they became a corporation, okay, so they could obligate other people into that debt that was left over from the war. But from that structure, this whole thing was built upon because the mother corporation of this federal corporation franchise system is the United States, Inc., and the states and the agencies are sub-corporation. It is like a franchise network of corporations <clears throat> doing business. So you said the United States with a small U, but you really meant lowercase, like capital U, lowercase, N-I-T-E-D, well, capital S. You know, it's, mean, we, don't, we never write it with a small U. No, and originally the word united was just a, a, a an adjective, United States. Okay, it, it, until later did it become capitalized, United States, as an entity. And even today, okay. the United States, Inc. is a corporation that is literally a city-state called Washington District of Columbia. So Washington, D.C. is the same as United States, Inc. They're interchangeable? Yes, that's what it is. And this all really began in 1871, right. and the federal government was corporatized then. Right. And in the manner of, of, of marking and delineating and di distinctifying, if that's the word, corporations, we usually capitalize um, the whole name, like United States of America, Inc., would be done in capital letters, right? Correct. That is accepted as a, a way of expressing a corporation. So when I was doing my research, I decided to look up on Dun & Bradstreet. I, meanwhile, I saw a wonderful video um, out of the people in the UK. They formed an organization called Lawful Rebellion. And then the gentleman's name was John Harris. And he had done most, much of this research before I became aware. And he tried to point everyone in the direction of look up on Dun & Bradstreet the name of your government institutions. So, of course, I did that. And on our website, at the time it was my vaccine website, um, we've changed the name. But all of the information I'm talking to you about, Sophia, people can check at anticorruptionsociety.com, which is my primary website. And all of this information is in the recent article called Dissecting the Basics of Our Legal System. And we have a chart on that article that I'm going to refer to because that was like my first thorough discovery of this corporate legal system, this corporate government system. So I went and I looked up United States, and sure enough, it was listed on Dun & Bradstreet in its all-caps name. I went and looked up um, United States Department of Health and Human Services, and it was listed in an all-caps name, DEPT, of Health and Human, SVCS. 
And I went all the way down to my state, to the governor, to the legislators, to the judges, to the health department, to my city and my school board. And lo and behold, and we have that in this chart, every single one had a different listing on Dun and Brad Street that most of the people were totally and still remain totally unaware of. But it is significant. Um, so once I realized that, I start investigating even further that if this thing is just a corporate franchise network, what does that mean about how we relate to it and it relates to us? No. Okay, well, let me pause you for a minute. Just so people understand, I like to take things piece by piece and make sure I understand them. So Dun & Bradstreet is the world's leading source of commercial information and insight on businesses for over 150 years. This is what it says on the dnb.com. That's right. Okay, so it's this is where you find out information about commercial structures and enterprises, entities, right? Right. So the fact that all these government departments are listed on Dun and Bradstreet, it can only mean one thing, right? Right. Okay. They're all engaged in commerce. Okay, so it can't mean that they put themselves there because they are an entity, they're a department, and departments are, they have to have a listing. It can't mean something as flimsy as that. Right. They, they, if they want to do business, they have to have a, a credit listing. Right. So this doing business, this, you know, this is what I keep, um, keep coming back to what this really means. Right. So anyway, go ahead. Okay. And I, we have a diagram on, on our website. We have two diagrams, and I'm hoping it would make, make this a little clear. The article is, What is the Government Anyway? What is our government anyway? And that's on Parents Against Mandatory Vaccines, my original website. We changed the name to better reflect our feelings about the whole vaccine issue. But... Um, we have two diagrams. One says the constitutional government, and it shows in that diagram sovereignty, and it shows freedom, and Bill of Rights, etc. And next to it, we made a diagram to show reality. And that is the circle that says Uniform Commercial Code, which is what is the law of the land today. And in it, we put statutes, fines, Fees, rules, contracts, licenses, regulations, penalties, and codes. To demonstrate that what you see every day regarding penalties, fines, fees for tiny little infractions of the rules is not what you think is representative constitutional government. This, these are all doing business, and they make a rule, and they make money off of you breaking their rule because then they can charge you a fine or a penalty. They're doing business. So this is how they make their profits, the, their collection of profits. One of many ways, yes. This is how they do it. They fine you, and they collect revenue. And I think people have heard about the police. Well, incidentally, the police are like Blackwater. You know, if you if I, I live in Columbus, the Columbus police work for the Corporation of Columbus, which is a private for profit corporation. And their job is to enforce the rules of the of the city. And they get paid and they get rewarded if they can give so many tickets. Many police departments across the country, they reward the officers. Some of them they even set quotas. You've got to get you've got to write so many tickets. A month and that's because the city wants the revenue yeah I think we understand that but what what's hard for people to grasp I think is that this represent representation um, standing or or meaning became swapped out for something entirely different that was about creating revenue Right. Uh, and, and doing business and making profits instead of representing the people. Now, I'm just trying to that's grapple good. with it. No, that's, right? that's excellent. Yeah, and I appreciate that because if you are trying to 
process this. Um, pretty much everybody else is having the same thoughts, and you bringing it out and making it easier to understand is wonderful. Okay, so Anita, is it bad for a city to need money in its coffers so it can do things like fix the, uh, you know, shower systems in the at the beaches and I mean this is what I deal with we had a leaky shower you wouldn't believe how much water it wasted all winter long and nobody reported it except me okay and uh, the lifeguards were not able to see it because it was on a staircase going up the cliff so I would tell them and I'd come to the beach three days later it was still leaking drib- dribbling dribbling water for day and night day and night now they've shut the water off in the city at the beach showers because California has a drought. I understand it. But did they care how much water they were spilling for all those weeks? They never really fixed it. No. So, you know, they is it wrong for the city to want money so it can do these things? It can no. buy decent plumbing. It's not wrong for the city to need to need to maintain itself. There's nothing wrong about that. What was outrageous is the fact that they they want you to somehow believe they work for your benefit, yet there you were. There you were, uh, someone who lives in that town, city, municipality, using their their facilities, and they did not respond to you with the kind of respect that you would anticipate if they were working for you. Does that make sense? But they're not well, working for you, Sophia. So what what you have to say they don't care much about. Well, again, these are, this is all about local politics. I don't happen to live in that city, uh-huh. but that's just an aside. I do use that beach more than any other, and I have called the uh, city engineer's office many times right. to please rake the kelp off the beach and please fix the shower. And what I have found problematic is the people are very nice who respond they do care and they appear to care at any rate they are very understaffed the city the public works only has two trucks and they can't you know send the people out and then they lost a couple of people and the guy who was left didn't know any plumbing so it's this kind of thing which keeps going back to the city is poor the city is poor the city needs more money the city needs more workers you know cutbacks cutbacks but then you read about things like the city council people and their retirement plans and all this. Right. And that starts getting, that's where your anti-corruption society uh, URL comes in. Like, wait a minute. Right. We don't have the services, but you guys have the retirement plans. Right. So I understand that. And I understand that as human corruption. That's and what, not- yeah, and that's what I always thought it was. But then when you look at it, it's been integrated into the entire system. This whole system has been altered and changed, uh, really monumentally since 1933. But, but they brought in, and if, if, if you've ever looked up the CAFR accounts, I don't know if you've done that, Sophia. Uh, yes. Okay. My city, for example, wants to raise the taxes so they can do work on the sewers. When we looked into the CAFR accounts, and that is the confidential annual financial report, that is a true reflection of that corporate net worth. Okay, we found they had $12 million sitting there, and yet they want to tax us to fix the sewers. And we brought it up, and um, they just ignored us. I mean, they they just ignored us. If, If they don't want to use the CAFR account, they won't use it. We found out that my city takes some of the money that they get and and puts it into investments so they can make more money. Now, how they spend that money, what we come to find out, we have no input into how they do it. They do whatever they want. They, okay. They accept Ow. money. They get engaged in contracts. All of this is done without the input of the general population. I understand. And I'm going to just throw in something here because I have a friend who has, she's retired now, but she was very, very high up in one of these 
governmental organizations, very high up. Okay. Okay? okay. So I asked her about CAFRs, and she said, of course. I said, do you know that there are, I explained everything you just explained, and she said, you don't understand. I said, what is it I don't understand? She said, this is how it works. Let's say that we're going to have a conference. You know, the, the entity that I work for, because it deals with a certain subject in the public realm, it's going to have a conference of experts. And it's going to have this conference in, whatever, 2017, because it takes time to plan a conference, right? So we budget out the conference. And, you know, the conference is only one of many, many things budgeted out. This is how she explained it to me. And so we have to set aside this much for the facility and this much for the catering and this much for the blah, blah, blah. And there's all these different things that you have to have at a conference. Then they have to fly in, you know, certain people who require it. They have to fly their own people in, so there's transportation. And she said, we have to set that money aside. And it's taken and budgeted and put in, you know, the log for 2017. So we can't spend that money. That's what the CAFR is for. The CAFR is budgeted money. It's money that we have decided to use for things in the future. And we have to only, we can only plan that conference or that project if that money exists. We cannot put the manpower and the brain power into planning something, and then we turn around and there's no money for it. So she told me, yes, millions of dollars are in the CAFRs because they pertain to plans for things in the future. Okay. Now, what's wrong with that? Do you, do, do you automatically know what's wrong with that story? Well, I can start guessing. Well, I think you probably have a pretty good idea what's wrong with that story. Okay, why don't you tell us? <laughs> She's doing business. She's not representing us. Let's say they have a conference about global warming, and when you and I know the science of global warming is bogus, here they've got money put aside that they're they're spending on a conference. They're all flying around. They're all having nice dinners, nice conference centers. The public is still being strapped with taxes, and they're engaged in so many, so many activities that are based on garbage science, um, political um connections they've got a whole agenda going on within the federal corporation and the state corporations that the public has no input into and some of it is pure under unadulterated poppycock bad science like vaccines the cdc has many conferences and lavish conferences on vaccines when you and i know the science does not support vaccines as being either safe or effective. But they've got plenty of money to entertain themselves um, without our input, engage themselves in putting together programs and projects based on bad science, based on political science, and all of it is uh, meant right now they're all determined to vaccinate everybody. Okay, so hold on. So they don't that, re represent us. That's what's wrong with it. I can give you a more pedestrian um, basis for which they set aside money. Right. Simply to set it aside. Right. Hey, they can dream up this or that or another thing. It doesn't even have to be based on bad science. It can be based on the appearance of being busy. Right. And then money is set aside. Potentially that money can be invested in order to return greater profits for the project. Right. I mean, we don't know what they do exactly with the money, but they, they don't even have to be premising their their plans and activities on faulty, you know, science or garbage, as you call it. They could do for any reason at all. And they all have cars and they all have all these perks and things, right. you know. Absolutely. So they treat themselves well. It's almost like a little royalty clan. It absolutely, that's a perfect analogy. That's absolutely yeah. right. Everything you said, Sophia, I agree with a thousand percent, and that's what they do. And when I yeah. tried to interact with these people, some of them worked for the um, regional planners, the county regional planners. Some of them worked for the city. S different cities, they have regional planning commission meetings where all these little 
representatives from the cities and counties come together and they look at federal grants and they meet and they work together on all kinds of things. And they're making all kinds of decisions that would affect everybody in central Ohio, okay? But everybody in central Ohio wasn't represented when these decisions were being made. They were making them unilaterally as this click. They walk like a click. They talk like a click. They relate to each other like a click. They belong to the in crowd, okay? Corporate government employees. And they knew each other. They were pals. I I met one of them. She worked for a nonprofit. They include nonprofit executive directors in this little clique. And I said, do you realize you're going to these meetings and making decisions that will affect my family, my neighbors, and we have no idea what you're doing, and you're doing it anyway. Do you do you have a problem with that? And you know what her answer was? <laughs> well, we announce our meetings. People can attend them. And I said to her, you putting an announcement in the paper, allowing me to attend and listen to what you're doing at your meeting, is not the same thing as representative government. Surely you can see that. But she did not really see that because it, it, so much of what you are saying is true. They hang together. They reinforce this image of what government is, which is this corporate profiteering structure. And they reinforce with each other that this is the way it should be and there's nothing wrong with it. That was my experience, Sophia. Yeah, and I think as they start, when they become inducted, as you could say, they have this, you know, self-inflated, warm, glowy feeling that they're now in local government or city government or state government or whatever. And then it becomes a game on a chessboard of profits and plans and projects. Right. And I'm sure these departments compete with one another also. Right. And there is that clan thing. I have witnessed that. Yes. I mean, I'm not... I do not have wide experience with these people, but I have seen some of this going on. But mostly what I'm trying to integrate now into my brain is that um, there isn't any real desire on any of the higher levels to serve the public and serve the public's interests. Correct. There is none. In fact, we have gone to meetings with our city council where, where we were complaining about a project that was really a threat to the safety of our high school children. And uh, the city council member took one look at us and said, I don't work for you. I work for the city. Now, you and I both know this wonderful woman named Ingrid Castle. I think you've had her on your program or people may yeah. be familiar with her. Um, and she is my co-host. She has a very dear friend who was elected to city council in a small town in Idaho. Okay. Once he got elected, they started his indoctrination and he sent me the paperwork that they gave him. They invited, and uh, I think invite is probably too mild a word. They demanded that all the newly elected council people come to these indoctrination sessions. And those in charge of what information was to be given to these individuals, newly elected city council people, was the attorney general for the state. And what they were told is, we want you to understand from here forward, you work for the city. You don't work for the people. You are employees of the city. He didn't go as far to say you are employees of the city corporation. But once they get elected, they are moved from what you and I thought they were, which is representatives for us, to become employees for the city. And that happens with county commissioners, trustees, every level of the government across the land. The minute they get elected and go into their offices, they work for the corporation. And they draw salaries, right? And they draw money, they get benefits and perks, and they make decisions that affect our lives, and they no longer consider it any obligation to us to have us involved in these decisions. In fact, most of them, maybe not the small ones, but the larger ones, and I experienced that myself, 
they actually hire public relations people to deal with the public. So if you have a complaint in my town, and I had a complaint with the Regional Planning Commission, and I actually was able to get an appointment with the executive director, only to find out that the meeting, at the meeting, he sat there quiet, and his government, his public relations individual did all the talking. So that's what they do to cover this up. They hire PR people to keep the public pacified Well, they conduct business without our permission. And it even, even more so, if you go to a meeting, you'll see the school board, you'll see it at county commissioner, city council. I've seen it so many times, so has my husband. They will allow you to speak at their meetings, their corporate meetings on their property. They will permit you to speak only if you identify yourself and your address and they will give you two or three minutes to talk. They will not respond to you. They will thank you and that's it. And that is the bone that they throw us. But our meetings are public. You can come to our meetings. You go to their meetings and you realize very quickly that you are being given this bone that you're being allowed to talk for two or three minutes and nothing changes. Sophia, your speaking at that meeting changes nothing. And here's what we found out. A lawyer found out the hard way. He went over his three minutes and they absolutely would not let him talk. They had the sheriff remove him from the room. Now, that is not representative government. Right. They're doing business. Then the other can of worms that we haven't mentioned, and I think it's in my article, is the fact that the federal government gives them grants, big chunks of money, which is how we got the police state in all our communities. They give them grants, big chunks of money. We'll give you this money. You sign the contract, and every one of these grants is called a grant contract. And somebody with the authority in your city or county will sign that grant contract. But once they do, they're obligated to the terms and conditions of the grant contract. Remember, these are all corporations doing business. Now, the public is never asked, should we engage in this contract? Should we implement this program? In my municipality, we found evidence, and actually we found an admission, that the city council had treated themselves to a retreat experience where they all privately went together at some state park lodge and they talked about business and they all voted outside of our our purview to pursue every grant contract or loan that was going to be made available. They adopted that as a policy So now you can quickly see how it is the federal corporation is implementing all of their agenda right in our own backyard. It's being done through these corporate grant contracts without our permission or knowledge. Wow. Yeah, that's how it's happening. Then, I mean, you used a very important word, implementing its agenda. So we have to ask ourselves, what is that agenda? Is it simply to make more money or is it to reduce our scope as the people into a much smaller um, uh, realm? What is it? Is it to, you know, enslave us while they remain free? So officers of these government corporations are enjoying a status and uh, they have the kind of muscle that officers of other corporations have too, right? Right. But before we get completely away from this, I just want to plant the seed in everyone's idea that we aren't without we aren't without tools to deal with this. So we, we haven't gotten there yet, but I don't want people to get so discouraged they think that we have no recourse. But they are run amok. And um, this is coming from the government agencies, quote, which is uh, departments of the corporation. You know, the United States is a corporation, and just like Monsanto has different divisions, the United States has 450 different agencies now, according to their own website. 
recorded in the Federal Registry. The corporation records much of what they do with their agencies in the Federal Registry. Now, that's been ongoing since 1933 when they started setting up this system during a permanent state of national emergency. And I don't want to get people too confused, but setting up an administrative network. In other words, the Constitution has the executive branch. It had the judicial branch and the legislative. Now we've got a fourth branch called the administrative branch, which Congress has no control over. Well, they may have something to say about how much money they get, but it is basically run from the by the criminals who control the White House. It is their network of agencies. And, I mean, if you want to go even further, there's a question that it's not all part of the United Nations. But um, hold on just a second. I'm sorry. Okay. But anyway, so it's coming from this administrative network with, that, that are all doing contracts. They're all contracting with each other. And we're pretty much outside of the loop. As you can see, nobody voted for the police state, right, Sophia? Nobody voted for that. No. And yet, the grant contracts came into my town, to my counties near me, Homeland Security. They came in in the form of contracts. These people got the equipment. They got money, they accepted the money, they signed the contract, and we wake up the next day and all of a sudden we're living in a police state and we don't know how that happened. That's how that happened. It came from the Department of Homeland Security, which in and of itself is not what you would call constitutional. However, it is a part of the corporation called the United States. So they're all doing business, and this is how we get all of this draconian rules and regulations and all that's coming into our communities through these contracts and agreements. I have a son-in-law who works for the state and I asked him about these grant contracts and he told me if a local government or a county or any of these people sign a grant contract and take the money, they absolutely agree to the terms and conditions of the contract and he said if they don't abide by them, then they have to give the money back. So you better believe they're going to impose all those terms and conditions on the public. And that's what they try to do. Because they don't want to have to give back the money. They don't have it. So I hope that people understand when they say doing business, that's not benign. It's got horrible effects on all of us in our communities. The fact they're doing business. Who reads the contracts for which the money is being taken? Who in these offices? Does anybody read them? Yes, and and I can speak for a couple of them that I've looked at closely. There may be different arrangements in different municipalities or counties or whatever, or the state. I can speak for several of them, okay? There was an offer of a, co- of a grant in my community, They wanted to do this road extension. The people were very opposed because it was a dangerous idea. And some wonderful, from wonderful local people filed a Freedom of Information Act to get all the paperwork regarding this project, this proposed project. And I had the good luck of finding these people and they sent it to me, which was wonderful because I got to see it. And what I saw on that was an application for a grant. There are many ways these municipalities can find out what grants are available. One of them is if you go to your regional planning commission website, they list them. Then there's other nonprofits that list. You can get a grant in this and you can get a grant in that. They share among each other how, where these grants are. So that if you're, you want one of these grants, all you have to do is download the application. And then the people in that institution, in the case of my city, it was the city engineer who got a hold of the grant and filled it out because it had to do with a road extension. So I got a hold of the application, the grant application, and how it was filled out and what was required in this application. I read the whole thing. I can post it if people want to read it because it's typical. They fill out the questionnaire, they provide this information, and then the grant contract required that they get this deal, this policy, this program approved by the city council. 
So in the in our case, they took this proposal. They went to a city council meeting. The city council did not read the grant contract. They just listened to the city engineer say, what a good deal, what a good deal, blah, blah, blah. And they voted for it. The public knew nothing about it. Okay? So now the grant contract has been approved by the city. Again, they're all doing business. And it gets submitted so that they can get their money. Well, that's when everything hit the fan. At that point, the public found out and we were just aghast. And we did everything we could. We called the, the Regional Planning Commission to report that the information on that application was false. And it was. We found out where they falsified it. It was false. Uh, it was misleading. The public had no support for this. This would be a dangerous project. Because so many of us intervened in this, the project died. But it was only a fluke that we found out about it at all, Sophia. I mean, it could have been I woke up one morning and there they were plowing up the street that's less than a block from me, um, changing the complete atmosphere of my neighborhood, and I would have had no way of stopping it by the time... The plow comes in to tear up a road. The money's already exchanged hands. But this is how it's done. It's all done without input from the public. So the people who woke up and, and found roundabouts in their community, and why do we have that when there was no problem? This is how it's being played out. Agenda 21 is a prime example of how right. this system is taking over local decisions. Now, I need to backtrack you a little bit. Okay. Um, so the city council doesn't read um, what's in the contract or the proposal. They just hear about it right. as it's presented, and then they vote on it. Right. And it goes into being effect. The money is paid if the city council, who's there to represent us because we elect them. Yes. But they don't read anything carefully and they allow it to come in because it's all about doing business. It's about bringing in money and right. keeping ourselves busy and making improvements. Right. So then um, I think you said that you, it was a fluke that people found out about it and enough people intervened that it didn't actually happen. Right. The grant was not but, approved. Right. But I think, Al, that... The fluke was that the thing didn't happen. It wasn't that enough people found out about it. Because I can tell you, Levenhine is a municipality in the greater um, city of Encinitas. Uh, I live in Encinitas. And Levenhine put in a secret fluoride plant to add extra fluoride to the water. Even though, as I experienced it from employees of the water district when I called up they were unhappy about it everyone was unhappy about it but it was done and now the fluoridation of water going to residents of this small community called Olivenhine is even more drastic than it is in the rest of San Diego okay so there was obviously a proposal on this fallacy or whatever myth that fluoride is good for you and will make our our bones and teeth stronger, right. which we all know about. Right. Um, and so that was brought in. Somebody decided to write a proposal, presented that to the city council. The money was caffered, and the city council voted on it, and it's built. And no amount of attendance from public at meetings, I mean, uh, certain, you know, Dr. David Kennedy, the dentist who's fought fluoride to the tune of a million dollars of personal money. He went to meetings. Everybody went to meetings. Uh, incidentally, <laughs> not to interrupt you, I talked to him. I talked to him on the phone when I first found out about Floyd. What a wonderful man! Yeah, he's pretty pretty amazing. But um, didn't stop anything. Okay, the money so had a, he, the money had exchanged hands by the time you guys interfered. Right. That's the problem. That this is done before you have a chance to vote in. They don't want you. So in interfere. your case, the example you gave where you said it was a fluke that it was reversed. It was a fluke that we found out before. Right. The so you found out in time right. before the money exchange. So that's the trick, right? Right. 
We found you out about the application for the grant. Application. Okay. That it was being considered. Now, that was a fluke in my mind. I don't know how that happened. I happen to live in a community with a lot of attorneys, and I have to question if that wasn't part of it. But we found out before the application was approved. Um, that absolutely is, if you can follow every grant application, if you can, I don't know how you're going to find out because not all of these things, I guess if you attended every city council meeting, most of these municipalities and communities, they have to vote on whether or not that they're going to support this grant. So if you're at every meeting and and they support the grant, that means that the application will be submitted. Now, you may still have time to get in there and and file your your objections and maybe that the grant won't. In our case, we actually proved that there was falsehoods on the grant application that's another thing Sophia when this thing was happening in your community there could have been on that grant applications information that was just blatantly wrong patently wrong I guess it's the word just absolutely wrong and the the city or whoever approved of it may not have known that that's how subversive this is yeah, well, in the case of fluoride, it's a very, very nasty, tangled mess. It is They're a nasty. Things. And now, yeah. Ingrid has a friend, I think I told you, who was on city council, and they were offered a, a grant contract. It had to do with the sewer system. Now, they were asked to sign that site unseen, Sophia. This thing gets even uglier. And he and his friend stood up and said, we're not signing any contract that we don't see. And the answer was, well, it's not ready yet. It's not ready yet. They were really pushing them to sign this contract without ever seeing it. Sure. Now, I want to ask you a question that's been hanging um, as you've been talking for the last uh, little while. Okay. I have many friends who believe that if we elect the right people ourselves into local office, we can turn everything around. And what you're saying makes me think that no, because if we get elected and into these offices or spots or positions where we are supposedly representing the public because we're so great and we know the right science and this and that, that once we get in those positions, it's going to be business as usual. We're going to be sucked into the same machine that, the last batch of people was in. That's correct. In fact, I even attended a meeting where local people were complaining that city council wasn't representing them, and they were they were kind of whining and complaining. And um, I agreed with everything they said, so I don't mean to say this is not a criticism of them. But for 20 years, they have watched people in my community. For 20 years, they feel they've watched things get worse, worse and worse, no matter who we put in office. Okay, in the little story I told about Ingrid's friend who got elected, and the minute he was elected, he told he was an employee of the city. That's the key. Once you get him in office, they don't represent you anymore. They work for the city corporation. And they are trapped into this mess, this corporate structure, where they're all doing business. And now they've got to, do we want the money from this grant? And and. It gets even worse because it is coming from the bankers. You know that. I'm sure you've covered that, Sophia, on your program many times. The bankers throw money at whatever they want implemented. And that which doesn't serve their purpose is deprived money. I mean, we all kind of know that, don't we? Right. Right. So they throw money at these agencies. These agencies throw programs at our elected officials, and I hesitate even to use that word, this is all coming through this agency network. There was a wonderful attorney, and um, I, I, I sent you a clip. It was His name is Jonathan uh, Edmund, and he is a constitutional slash administrative attorney. He was on Coast to Coast on July 7th, and he explained in relatively few words that since the 30s, that what we're seeing is administrative rule. 
And that's what I'm describing to you. These corporate divisions, EPA, USDA, all of these government corporate divisions, CDC, they're all part of this administrative rule. And they are the ones that provide the contracts and the grants to, now the one you're talking about where they increase the fluoride, I mean, where did the money come from? Did it come from the CDC? Where did it come from? We always have to ask where the money came from because if the the controllers of these agencies, which is certainly not the president, that's the secret government, if the controllers want everybody vaccinated, they make money available to go into the form of grants to public health, um, to schools, to anyone they want to push their agenda, they make money available. And so from that point forward, it is it is pushed on the public. And we don't even know about it until somebody said we violated a rule. What do you mean until um, when someone says we violated well, a rule? So they put in new rules to go along with it, right? Right. And sometimes if, if we're just humming along in our life, now like some of the people in your community probably were unaware that this fluoride change took place. Well, as far as the co community at large is concerned, there's maybe... I could probably count on one hand people right. who cared about it. Right. Because it's we've got sleeping sheeple types, you know, like everyone else, and they all think fluoride is good for you. Right. But so, in, the, in the police state situation, along with all of this equipment they get, there's a whole bunch of rules that they want to enforce that the people aren't even aware of until the police stop and tell them you violated one of our rules. So that's why I use that as an example. But enforcing a rule... A new rule or rule a regulation is part of the um, terms and conditions of the grant contracts. Right. And then that gives the opportunity to create itty bitty uh, revenue. Right. And and to require that people register this or register that. There is uh, someone did an article saying they're going to try to get everybody's vaccination record to the police so they all know who's fully vaccinated. In other words, somewhere they're going to want to know what your vaccination record is. Th these are the rules that then they try to inflict on us. Uh, some states have said, well, if you get your driver's license, there's a new rule. The new rule says you have to agree to have a blood draw should the police want to do that. This is where your fascist state is coming in through these rules and regulations that are coming through these agencies and these grants. And it's all a corporate structure that the people, again, because they vote for city council, they have no awareness that once city council person gets elected, they no longer work for you, they work for the corporation. Now, the meeting I was telling you about where everybody was complaining and whining about no matter who we put up for city council, the mi things just kept getting worse. I was at that meeting and I raised the question. It's because, I think it's because it's a corporation. You know that's got articles of incorporation. It's a corporation doing business. There was an attorney in that room and the attorney, you would not believe how fast he cut me off. It was speed of lightning. And he said, that doesn't mean anything. Next, and he moved everything, moved everybody's attention somewhere else. And that's when I realized these bar attorneys who work for these cities and these municipalities, they like their job, they like their power, and they don't want the people who live in these communities to realize that this is not a lawful government, this is a corporation doing business. They want us to continue to respect them and send them our money. Well, on some level, they are members of the community also, and they are living, breathing human beings who need clean air and water and all of that good stuff. And so that all goes scrapped. It gets thrown to the wind. Well, what happens, and, and I, a perfect example of this was the California legislation taking away exemption rights for parents. The way this thing plays out, when, when the elected people are given the information to vote on something, 
There are gatekeepers, and this happened with the fluoride issue as well. They are told that no matter what the community says, the community is wrong, they should listen to the government agencies. So when you say your local people want clean water, there's no doubt that the elected in your community want clean water. The difference is they're not going to listen to you and Dr. David Kennedy. They are going to listen to the CDC. I listened to a, it was on Alex Jones, Paul Connett spoke in front of the legislature in Austin, Texas, trying to convince them to stop fluoridating the water. And he actually got a response from the city council. They actually said to him, why should we listen to you when we've got the best scientists in the CDC telling us the exact opposite? Good point. See, if we don't discredit these agencies, all of the people who get elected get these grants from these agencies and they honestly believe they're doing the right thing. One of the battles when I, I was peripherally involved in what went on in California and I kept saying you've got to attack the agency because they believe the agencies. They don't know who they are. They don't know what they are. They don't know that they're for-profit corporations themselves. They don't know that their science is bought and paid for. They honestly believe all these agencies are experts. And if like, if you don't attack the agencies, you'll lose. Well, no one, now, I, no one would attack the agency's credibility and therefore they lost. Okay, so now I'm hoping that this is part of your uh, solution step because I'm getting antsy. You're get I mean, I'm, I'm saying that because, you know, I'm so used to hearing this bad stuff, bad stuff, bad stuff. It's coming at us from all over the place. But when I posed that um, question to you a few minutes ago, that if we do elect, which I think is a gargantuan task, if we replace all these people who are there with people like us, let's just say activists. If activists occupied every office in all the local governments and then, you know, stepped up to higher and higher positions, you're telling me it's not gonna it's not gonna change anything because the system is the grant contracts game. Right. And right. that has to show profit. Right. Because the whole beast got swapped out. It's like they took out one mule and they brought in a different mule. Exactly. They took out representative government and they replaced it with commercial government. And they're all corporations doing business. That's exactly what happened. It was done by the bar. It was done by stealth and it's been done over the last century gradually enough that the people don't realize that this is what's happened. Now this attorney that I referred to Jonathan Edmund, he knows it's happened because he's tried to restore constitutional government and realizes very much that if your elected officials vote for something, and this is another layer, let's just say they vote for something that's good, that you all kind of like. Well, in my state, we have the Ohio Revised Code that shows what these corporate legislators vote for. Then to implement it, it goes into the administrative aspect of the state government and local, whatever. Now, if you look at their website, Ohio Revised Code, you'll see there's another little word there called OAC. That's Ohio Administrative Code. So when the legislators pass a law rule or something, whatever, it gets signed by the governor, then it is turned over to the administrative level of the state government. And that would be, for example, public health. If, the, if some statute is passed regarding mand mandatory vaccines, the governor signs it into law like just happened in California, then the implementation of that law gets turned over to an administrative network, public health. Now, once it gets into that arena, then they decide how it should be implemented. And that's what that attorney, Jonathan Edmond, was screaming about. These people can implement it in such a way that it's no longer true to, to the letter that was 
the letter of the code that was passed. And no one realizes this, so nobody's holding them accountable. And Ingrid came up with this in Idaho. They passed a rule about vaccines that allowed pretty much anybody to um, exempt themselves if they did so in writing. Well, it got signed into law, and then it went to the administrative section of public health. Well, they had taken a grant, and so they changed the rules of how this thing was going to be implemented. And lo and behold, the intent of the law was lost, and you've got a whole new can of worms that was created by the administrative agencies. This is what Jonathan Edmond was talking about specifically, that these rules, regulations that they refer to as laws, aren't even being done by the elected people. They're being done by the administrators to match the grants. So, yeah, it should be discouraging only in the sense that um, until the local, local government stops taking grants, they would stop taking grants immediately. It would slow this down. And I, we even put an article on, on uh, one of my websites saying we can no longer, it's on anti-corruption society, we can no longer tolerate corporate governments. And we gave the reasons that how on local government this plays out and the people keep getting the short end of the stick. And our solution was, of course, to keep, start by getting local government to stop accepting grants. But only because you would educate people as to the nature of this commercial government. Right. I mean, th right now that would, again, that would slow it down. Sophia, you're absolutely right. It would not be it would not be a godsend just all of a sudden restoring us back to representative government. That would only be a step to slow it down while we get more people to understand what has transpired. The people I work with, none of us think this can be fixed quickly, okay? Quickly would be disastrous because there's too many people employed in it. But it can be reversed gradually once we understand how it was put in place, how it functions. We can all start to help reverse it. Quickly will just be disastrous. And everybody I talk to says the same thing. It will not change overnight. It has to change gradually, which is good since most people don't understand it in the first place. But there is, well, hope. There is hope for us, Sophia, and before we leave the topic, there is hope for us because they're not a sovereign government, okay? They're a corporation. A corporation cannot be a sovereign government. They don't have their own money. They use private Federal Reserve notes, okay? And if you look at the Clearfield Doctrine... In and of itself, the fact we don't have sovereign currency removes the sovereignty from what we call government. What they are... Okay, I have to stop you because I have... To, we, I just need to have this one thing clarified. Oh, sure. You said we have to get them to stop taking grants, right. the local government. Right. So first step to that would be educating either the people who are there to to the commercial nature of government in general right. or getting people into office who understand that. But, you know, Anita, I always say that there's no stop in the universe. There's only, if I tell you stop eating potato chips, what you're really going to do is start doing something else. So you might wrap up the bag and put a clip on it and put it in the cupboard. But that's a diff you're taking a different action now. So right. what would the local government do in lieu of taking the grant money? What would it do? Okay, that's a wonderful question. They have been engaged in so many things that are detrimental to the community. Okay, unraveling this to do so would require a lot of work on their part. And that would be valuable work. That would be work well appreciated. And it would, it would end up with a, a, a healthier community. It would end up with economically a stronger community. That would be the next step they do is to review all their regulations, codes, statutes, rules that they have ever passed. And trust me, this would keep them busy, 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 busy. 
and revoke them. Anything that these people pass can be revoked. All legislation can be revoked. I ran into it on the Ohio Revos- Revised Code. They would have a code and right after it would say revoked and it had been removed. Somebody had voted to get rid of it. So when you say you don't just close the clip on the potato chips, then what you do is you say we're not going to have any more rules, regulations and grants coming in. Now let's try to really improve our community and look back at what's on the books and start revoking this stuff that's causing harm. Does that make sense? So, yes, it makes sense, but, I'm going to be the yes, but guy. Right. You would really have to have widespread education and understanding. Right. And that's what's missing. Right. You would, Otherwise, you'd have a bunch of people getting in the way because their brother-in-law was on the city council before, and he was all for such and such that you don't want to be for now, and... Um, you'd get this harangue and argument situation and this very divided, politicized, chaotic, uh, you know, because it's just in general, if you get a room full of 20 people and you have five people educated about, let's say, fluoride in the room and they are trying to explain to the other 15, you're going to end up in a chaotic state. That's what I think. Well, I, I think you you could be right. Um, there are people in government who aren't happy and don't know what to do about it. In other words, most of these rules and restrictions will eventually come down on them as well. They are in financial straits. They're in difficulty. Um, there are, for instance, if you want to improve the local community, the economy of the local e- community, There's many ways to do that. They are not doing that. They were actually paid grant money and they are being pushed in the wrong direction. So they, instead of getting a healthier economy, a wonderful economist lawyer slash wrote a book called Going Local. Um, And he talked about how bringing back local jobs. Right now, they're, they're in my community, for instance, They are taking, they took a whole chunk of jobs and got rid of it to, quote, save money by outsourcing it to India and having um, call centers do it, okay? Now, when they look at that casually, they say, well, geez, we saved all this money. But if they would look at it realistically, they would realize that all these people who lost their jobs are no longer going to pay taxes, Okay, one second. Give me an example of a community job that can be outsourced to India. Anything that's calls. Like what? Any call center. And they've done it in my state. But in the community, I mean, what is in my state? In my in my city, let's just say uh, garbage service. It doesn't matter, or or recreational facilities. It doesn't matter if the job is just to answer a call. Okay. That's what I'm saying. They can. So we've got people in India answering calls for garbage disposal in oh, for, Lima, Ohio. Well, all kinds of things. They they um, services in the city of Columbus, for instance. They found that happening there. Whereas they used to hire people to take questions from the public, and that would be a a, a, a lady or a man sitting in a chair, collecting a paycheck, generally associated with some benefits, okay? And this individual was an employee of the city corporation, and their job was to answer questions and complaints from the public. Well, it's cheaper to hire somebody in India to answer questions and complaints in the public and just give them a script. Mm -hmm. And that way the job's gone, and, and they save money. That's how they look at it. But there's another angle to that, which is the meaning of what's happening. People in India are taking calls about garbage disposal on the other side of the world. They're taking calls about, you wouldn't believe how many things they're taking calls about. Here's the thing. They don't know what they're, this is another layer, Sophia, of the corporation trying to eliminate accountability. 
I, I don't know if you've tried to reach anybody in your in your municipality, your city, or locally to get sol- problems solved. It is a mountainous job because first you have to find a living flesh and blood being, and they prefer to use a phone tree if they can. Then they prefer you email them so they don't talk. They're trying to eliminate accountability. So um, every way they can interfere with the interaction between the public and the corporate agency, they do. So getting recourse, getting questions answered, getting anything done um, becomes very, very difficult for the public. Okay, well, I have tried. I have called, as we mentioned at the beginning of this podcast. And so far, I've gotten local people okay. who seem to care. Okay, that's good. Yeah, but again, I'm calling in a rather small town. I'm not calling in the city of Columbus. Right, and they may not have the money to outsource this job. In other words, that all of these decisions are made on finances, okay? They're not be- made on public service. And that's the point, because they're a for-profit corporation. Now, if they run out of money, they do have to close divisions of, and departments of the municipality. But the worst problem, and I know some people saw Clint Richardson's Corporation Nation, and some people are aware of Walter Burian and Kaffer. The worst problem is that we don't have a representative government. That's the problem. They are functioning outside. They have a whole system that is set up to function without input from us. And yet, we are still expected to follow their rules and pay their taxes. That's what we've lost. Yeah, and that's very, very profound. It is. And I don't, I mean, people should care about this as they should care about a lot of other things. Well, and you know they know something's wrong but they just don't get the corporate nature of the of the government they don't understand that the people who work for that corporation don't work for them and know it now when you call up and you got a really nice person they generally put the nice people on the phone and that keeps mm-hmm. the public thinking that they care but it doesn't mean you're going to get the problem solved it just means there was a really nice person you talked to on the phone so let me ask you a question. Are you aware of this corporate personhood? Yes. Stuff? Okay, so that was, I think, a uh, seminal case, 1886. Yes. Uh, Santa Clara County versus Union Pacific Railroad. Right. right. And it conferred by, you know, trickery, um, the rights, individual personhood rights to corporations. So I'm assuming that these government corporations have the same protections, right? That Presumably. In other words, to sue them, they're a little bit different. To sue them, you have to go through the administrative process. And we've got a, an example of a law firm who puts together a, prog- a PowerPoint explaining how complex that is. Um, it's not easy to sue them. You can make a claim against them if your car gets wrecked in one of their potholes. They'll tell you how to submit a claim, and you can sometimes win that. But... To hold them liable for their behavior is very, very difficult. Um, But the personhood is a, maybe that would be another show because we're talking about how we interact with these institutions. And because they're corporations, this is difficult for people to understand. Corporations, because they're fictitious, have no control over living flesh and blood men, women, and children. None. Okay, people really need to understand that a corporation isn't real. It has no control over you or me. The way they're getting control over us is they want to contract with us. So they get us to contract with them through Social Security, through uh, registering our car, signing up for a driver's license. And when we do that, we sign the paperwork. And that is us signing to contract with this corporate entity. And from that, they have the um, presumption that they can inflict all their rules and regulations upon us because we consented. And that is where our answer lies, Sophia, to understand all the paperwork they ask you to sign. <clears throat> there's, there's a reason. 
there's a reason they want your signature and everything because that is the contract that obligates you to them. Mm -hmm. Once you understand that, and we did put together lawfully yours on the Anti-Corruption Society. It is a guide. It's called a People's Empowerment Guide to our Corporate Commercial Legal System. And what it does is it helps people understand that you're contracting with them and helps them understand how not to contract with them and how to challenge the presumptions that they're making that you have contracted with them when you have not. That our, well, our individual solutions are there. Changing the whole structure is going to be difficult to say the least. Well, let's save that for part two so that our listeners can wrap their head around this introduction. Right. I think that's that's a wise idea. That, yeah. That's a really good idea because your questions were just so pertinent, helping people understand how the corporate government works, and they all need to understand what, what you were asking. Yeah. And to ponder it even, you know. I mean, right. I think that these shows... You have to take things step by step. Absolutely. And when you're ready, that's what I like about podcasts. You can go and switch on the part two or find another, you know, the sequel. That's right. Continuation. So thank you very, very much. Thanks. The um, MP3 of the clip that Anita sent me of the uh, constitutional lawyer will be linked. Um, and you can listen to it. And um, I guess we'll... We'll carry on with this. We'll pick it up in a second show and maybe a third one. Maybe you'll just have to keep coming to explain all this to, to me and other people. And then the Anti-Corruption Society website, that will be linked as well. Please, everybody, go there. I did look at a few things in the last few days, and they're very clearly laid out. Um, we've got to We've got to do something. We can't just live our lives and say, you know... Let's not worry about it. I'm having too much fun. Let's let someone else who has a mind for this. Anita, I have to commend you because just the beginning, what you were describing, when you went into the Board of Education um, contracts and the language, that not everybody would do that. Well, they would, you know, this is a, it's a, gruesome, it's so yucky, it's like chewing on nails and screws. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, you know what, you're right, but, but um, yeah, you're right. What can I say? And I'm, I'm very grateful that, that you're taking the time to help people start to understand this because truly that's where our solutions lie. And uh, too many people are getting like this so discouraged and, and it, we really do have options, Sophia. And thank you for being willing to look at this situation and so we can move on to what are our options so that we don't get entrapped in this corporate structure. Well, I'm grateful to you because you're the one who beat the path through the jungle and I'm only the one following and saying, what's this you found and what's this? And I'm making it possible for other people to hear a little about it. Thank With you. me kind of as a, you know, a slow poke translator making you stop and clarify, 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 because that's how it has to be for me. If I, if something goes over my head, then really it's lost forever. And that's so good that you're that way. I'm so glad you're that way. That makes you a good instructor because you're, you, other people are going to be just like you. Yeah. Well, good. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to mull over all this. I'm inviting you back for absolute sure. And many thanks. thanks and people are going to, Listen to that MP3, go to your website, and then start talking. You have to start talking to all those brothers-in-law and all those people who know people, who people who are running for city council. We have to find out. Do you guys know this? Yeah. That's our next step. Okay. Thank you so much, Sophia. You're very welcome. Thank you, Anita, and all the best, and you'll be back soon. Yes, I hope so. Take care. <laughs>